Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth Mama Charitable Foundation Visiting Professor in Buddhist Studies Lecture Series. Today is the third lecture of the series, and we are very happy and honored to have invited Professor Padmasiri Da Silva again to share with us his wisdom and insight. Professor Da Silva is the pioneer and leading scholar in the field of Buddhist counseling. He was the professor and head of the philosophy and psychology department of the University of Peridinia in Sri Lanka back in the 1980s. He is also the author of many influential books in Buddhist counseling, such as the book An Introduction to Buddhist Psychology and Counseling, which was first published in 1979. So back in the 70s, Professor Da Silva has already started his research in this field, and with over 80 years of age now, he's still very actively involved in the research in Buddhist counseling. Today, he's going to deliver the lecture with the theme, Exploring the Nature of Emotions, the Somatic Perspective in Darwin and James, and the Iodogenic Perspective in Freud. So with the further ado, please join me to give a big hand to warmly welcome Professor Da Silva to begin his lecture today. I want you to look at these faces. Look at the faces well. Now, who can guess what is in these faces? Take the... Take this one. Yes, what's it? Yes, correct, yes. Anger. Anger. Okay. Just below anger. Fear. You know, fear and surprise are fairly similar. Here's a very interesting one, very easy to spot, this, this one. What is that? It's the thing which naturally comes on the face when you don't burn something. Disgust. So, you see, anger, fear, disgust. Now, Darwin considered these as basic emotions. Then you go to the other one. It's a little difficult, but this time on the left side, eh? uh, that is really surprise. Surprise, surprise, and fear, they are fairly similar. This is very easy. Yes? Joy. Joy. And the last one, this one, yeah, what's it? It is sadness, close to depression, right? Now these are the, this, I, I put them to show how graphic the Darwinian, Darwinian contribution was, and this is over 100 years back, so his, uh, I got interested in this emotions project because of these facial expressions. At that time, then I had come from Hawaii and I was settling down. In the East West Center in Hawaii, there were 
planning a cross-cultural study of emotions. And they wrote to me whether I can collect the emotion words in Sinhalese. Another person collecting the emotion words in Tamil. So I agreed to it. So that is the first thing that we did. And about 15 countries cross-culturally, they want to find out whether these emotions are pan-cultural. So they took photographs of American faces and took them to Malaysia. So like that, you know, across other countries. So the general thesis was that facial expressions are pan-cultural. Not 100% correct, but to a great extent. Uh, so that we'll say you go to another country, you meet a person, even if he can't speak, from his face, you, you, you will be able to find out his mood, you know. So this is, a, then later we collected emotion stories. What makes a person angry? What makes a person happy? Like that we have to collect. Those are called emotion antecedents. And they were all put in a graph. And of course the Jerry Boucher, uh, a student of the very famous Paul Lekman, to whom I will remember, Delhi Bruce conducted this program and we had one meeting in Hawaii, the second one in Singapore. Ultimately, he was trying to prove that Darwin's theory is fairly true across cultures, which is called pan-cultural, right? Now, generally, for disgust, across cultures, they may be different. Some, some cultures are disgusted with something, others are not. But the emotion not disgust is very similar. So, now, apart from this, these are called basic emotions. Now, how about jealousy? Is there anyone, can, anyone here who can tell me how to construct jealousy? What are, jealousy is not one emotion. Several emotions go to make jealousy. What are those? Now, that is why Freud is interesting. When we come to Freud, we move out the Darwinian theory. They are called ideogenic. Ideogenic means they are not physical, physiological, but ideas. I ideas dominate. Now, to have jealousy, the most important ingredient in jealousy is anger. If there is no anger, you, you, you can't get jealousy. Also, jealousy involves your attachment to someone else. And the possibility is that your status being challenged by a second person outside. Right? So, so that is also the feature of it. There are some beautiful studies of uh, these emotions like jealousy made in literature, in novels, and, and so on. So jealousy, now the very important problem is, is there a difference between jealousy and envy? Now in Pali, there is only one word, Issa, for both jealousy and envy, but they are different emotions. Now in envy, we said they are a very rich millionaire, and uh, you don't like that. So then you develop envy, but you don't get anything in return. Right? That is why envy is very insidious. Envy is very insidious. You are just hoping that someone will millionaire will flatten out. But you don't get anything out of it. In jealousy, that's a right. And very often in genuine, uh, in jealousy, there's genuine love. Very, very often. Not always. So you feel that you have a right to something which is being challenged. So like that when you, it was my hobby going into all these beautiful distinctions between one emotion and the other. And uh, about two years back we had a very big conference in, in Myanmar. I presented the first study of disgust. Disgust, especially in the context of Buddhism, hardly anyone has gone into it. Because disgust in Buddhism 
becomes a form of meditation. If there is a contemplation and this, this question is born. So you will find that in, against the meditation setting, against everyday life, uh, all over you get these emotions. And emotions are very crucial in counseling. Now the theory that I discovered was EFT, Emotion Focused Therapy. Now, unlike those days, there is a great deal of interest in human emotions. So I hope this little thing will, and of course, there are a lot of study on the brain now, how these emotions are related to the brain. Now, I'm not going to discuss all that now, but uh, in the brain especially there is an area called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is generally related to things like anger, uh, fear and so on. And very often, the neuroscience is important. I'll give you now some examples from neuroscientists to prove this point. First we go to, so there has been a remarkable emergence of research on emotion studies with a focus on the body and brain during the last two recent decades and the historical roots are found in Charles Darwin and William James, the, 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 what are called the somatic emotions, the body-based emotions. The practice of embodied mindfulness in therapies like pain and trauma management also indicate the emotions of what is described as somatic psychology. Now this book here, the, this one, this one discusses all this, both Darwin and James, and the relation to, so that's, a, this is really a very useful book. In concentrated form, most of these things are found in this one. Now, I will refer to three important discoveries of three neuroscientists. First is Antonio Damasio. Now, Antonio Damasio is a wonderful discovery. There was a brain kept in the museum. And uh, year after year, people are trying to find out whose brain is it and why is it so important. The story is this. The story belongs to a railway engineer. A railway engineer putting a railway track. On the way, there are a lot of stones, rocks. The rocks had to be dismantled. So what they do is they make a big... Uh, a hole on the rock and then put dynamite into it and then with the rod you you put sand and wrap the sand and then it burst. So they were doing this for some time but one day something terrible happened. Can you guess what happened was as he was doing this he was talking to the chap above he forgot to put the sand. And what happened? That rod turned inside and went through his head. You, ca you can't even imagine. And this, he was not okay for a day or two, but after that, the other miracle was he looked very normal. But something happened. As the days passed by, this chap did not keep to the timetable for work. He was very, very irresponsible. He was not caring for others. So theory is that that is the portion related to human emotions. You see, Antonio Damascus is a brilliant book. In fact, when I first read this, I couldn't believe it. So Antonio Damascio, the neuroscientist, proved that there is a section of the brain related to the human emotions. Now, the second one comes from Joseph Ledoux the emotional brain. Now he cites the case of a person in the evening in a lonely forest 
going on a walking track. Then suddenly he tries to run. He has trampled, trampled a bundle of twigs and he thought it's a rattlesnake. Now the theory here is this, that, that is the subliminal. That is, before the message goes to the central nervous system, it is hijacked by the amygdala. Amygdala is the irrational center. So before the brain, he has trampled some tricks, and before the central nervous system says it is, it is tricks, the amygdala hijacks and then he tries to run away. Now amygdala is responsible for a lot of, not unconscious, what we call subliminal behavior. Raga anuse, patiga anuse, mana anuse. Those are subliminal tendencies. They are there. So, Joseph Ledoux's discovery, now, in fact, I changed the meaning of anuse in Pali from unconscious to subliminal. But early I was introduced influenced by Freud. Now Freud and the unconscious will come to it later. Third one was the groundbreaking discovery by Davidson. Davidson who really worked with a, a, a Buddhist monk. For, I, I think that experiment lasted about three hours. And he went to his life story and everything and the idea is that if you meditate not merely meditate, but live a meditative life, believe, uh, go, go through the Buddhist ethics properly and so on, that has a tremendous impact on the brain. And a certain part of the brain, what's called the left side rather than the right side. So David Sen was really very famous and after that he has written quite... So I have now taken three important neuroscientists, Antonia Donasio, Joseph Ledoux, and Davidson. To understand the enriching focus in contemporary studies of Joseph Ledoux, 1988, Antonia Donasio, 2000, and Richard Davidson, 2000, along with a very good neuroscientist, Daniel Siegel, who have written immensely on these various areas. It's a focus on the body and brain. One has to probe the historical roots you find in Darwin. That is the same thing. And Darwin was re rediscovered by Paul Lechman after 100 years. Paul Lechman, that is Jerry Bush's teacher, Paul Lechman. I met him a number of times, Paul Lechman, uh, in Australia. He, he, he did a brilliant study. I have referred to this tradition as the somatic tradition. During recent times, there has been a rebirth of somatic psychology. It's a complete department of universities, even uh, universities like the Naropa University, we have a complete uh, department on somatic psychology. I have also introduced the term somatic intelligence relating to the wisdom of the body in this new book. Now it is against this background that I wish to present the revival in Darwinian studies and William James, which is the main uh, theme of this presentation. Darwin wrote a book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, which was first published in 1872, but released and reissued in 2015, the new edition. It was not until 100 years had passed that systematic study of the autonomic changes in the brain, emotions of anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, Surprise was made by Paul Lechman in 2008, who published this work. Paul Lechman's thesis on the universality of facial expression, depicting different emotions, was to a great extent influenced by Darwin's work on emotions. 
Darwin was developing his emotional studies in the background of the theory of evolution. So that's where he, he accumulated his biology. So you find that Darwin was far ahead of his times. Now Paul Ruckman says, species constant learning also cannot account for our recent finding that younger peers are not from this cluster marked by different changes in heart rate, sweating, skin temperature, blood flow and so on. But he says that itself is not enough. Evolution as a concept has to be used to explain this Darwin discovery. Darwin integrated his work on emotion in the light of the theory of evolution and Ekman feels this is important in the theory of emotions and facial expression. It was not until 100 years had passed that Darwin's similar changes were discovered. This remarkable somatic heritage passed through William James, who was professor of philosophy and psychology at Harvard University much later, who was also influenced by Buddhism. My personal interest in Darwin's emotion studies was first aroused when Jerry Boucher invited me, that is the story of the narrated how they had these conferences in Hawaii the, on pan-cultural emotions. Pan-cultural emotions are very interesting. In Sri Lanka we had a unique pan-cultural emotion which was not there and that is guilt. I couldn't find a word for guilt though that experience is there. The, uh, Due to the impact of the West, the guilt is an experience, but it was basically a Freudian thing. Now in Indonesia, they had a beautiful emotion called feeling small in the world. That is when you feel like a speck of dust, you know. Now in that tradition, so like that, there were, those are called culture-specific emotions. They are not pan-cultural. So you go into these cultures, you find that some emotions are... Now, I don't know what specific emotions are found in Hong Kong, apart from the basic emotion. I think in the future, your students who are going to do the counseling course should find out whether apart from the basic emotions in the Hong Kong culture, there are any specific emotions which is specifically coming from the... Chinese culture and so on. So anyway, there is a distinction between pan-cultural emotion and uh, other uh, emotions. The Darwinian theory has been challenged by, by what are called cognitive theories. Now, cognitive theories, a jealousy would be a cognitive theory. Envy would, because they can, you have to use thought patterns to explain cognitive theories. And that was, of course, Freud's contribution to which I will come. According to Ekman, facial expressions begins and then reaches an apex of the muscular contraction that is going to occur. The muscular contraction, now if it is just a second, it is one. But on the other hand, what is called a smile is an aggregate, aggregate of little, little muscular changes. The extent of the muscular contraction provides information about the intensity of the emotion. Another important point about basic emotion is that the facial expression is universal and cultural. Basic emotions I have already mentioned. Now the emotions which are not basic, which Freud Focus the things like guilt, shame, pride, jealousy, envy. Now those are called higher cognitive emotions. They come very much in therapy and they are very difficult to handle uh, because they are more intricate. These emotions which captured the imagination of pride may be considered as, I have coined a term called ideogenic, as different from 
somatogenic or somatic, ideogenic. Thought patterns are important. It is also called a cognitive theory. A cognitive theory of emotion will trace an emotion into thought patterns. I am jealous because my position is being challenged by someone. I am jealous, I am envious because I don't like that man having such a lot of money, you know, though I, I, I don't get anything back. And anger is at the root of a lot of negative emotions. Anger is at the root of negative emotions. In fact, now in Buddhism, there is a meditation, contemplation on the disgust. Now, during the time of the Buddha, this became very popular, but some monks had gone to the extreme and committed suicide. So the Buddha brought in new changes. His discussed meditation is only applicable to certain personality types. There is a more positive, uh, positive meditation where you develop peace, uh, called sukha, uh, sukha, uh, uh, peace, joy, shanti. So that is why I just mentioned this because I done a lot of work on this emotional disgust and its place in contemplative meditation and so on. These emotions which capture the imagination of pride may be considered ideogenic as composed, uh, opposed to somatogenic. The other variety of emotions which was not explored by Darwin, but was also the area of the study of the East West Center in Hawaii, in which I participated, presenting in the Sri Lankan emo I had uh, about 30 emotion words from Sri Lanka. The anger vocabulary was very long. Doesn't mean that Sri Lankans are necessarily angry people. <laughs> but. But, but that's the way uh, the, the vocabularies. Uh, those pan cultural vocabularies are very interesting. Now you can do that for one for Singapore, collect all the words. What we did was we collected the words, put, put them into cards, and gave to people to put them together. Put them together, and then so decided that this is more prominent, this is less prominent, and so on. There was already research studies which indicated that the basic emotions are to a great extent found in different cultures. While Darwin did not find a method for measuring facial expression. That was what Paul Lechman devised a technique for measuring face. He's an expert. Even the criminology department consults him to find out whether people are lying. Uh, 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 Paul Lechman can uh, find, he was a remarkable exponent. He spent months and months measuring facial expressions. Now there is a best-selling book. It's, it's by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know whether you have heard of him. Ah, yes. Malcolm Gladwell's book, you know the title of the book? The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. <laughs> it's so title, you know. <laughs> the Power of... He's a best, he's wonderful writer. He won several awards. You must read this book, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. Now there, he meets uh, Paul Lechman and then he has written a... Beautiful. Now this is what he says. Ekman and Frierson work together. They combine through medical books that outline the facial muscles and they identify every distinct muscular movement in the face that one could make. There was 43 such movements. Ekman and Frierson call them units. Then they sat across each other for days and end and began manipulating each action until. 
first locating the muscles in their mind, then concentrating and identifying, watching each other closely, and so on and so on. This is a remarkable work. Later they combine and it's called the facial action coding system. Now we come to William James. William James is closer to Buddhism. In fact, uh, as this famous instance where William James was presiding at a meeting and walked in Anagarika Dharmapala. At that time there was a very big conference with Anagarika and lots of other people. And then William James got up and said, Venerable Anagarika, this seat, this chair, is for you and not for me. Well, he, he was so remarkable and um, he was greatly influenced. Uh, William James has two volumes, Principles of Psychology. A remarkable book, remarkable book. You can read it from time to time, time to time. And that is why there was this famous writer, puzzle that William, this is what he said. First you cry and then you feel sad. First you run, and then you feel fear. First you are happy, and then you start laughing. Now this is like putting the cart before the horse, but not so much, because this has been revised, rejected, revised, right? The somatogenic people who are focused on the body, in fact, there is a very nice book called Gut Reactions by, by Jesse Prince, where he revised the William James theory. So we will see to what extent this rider, this puzzle, that first you run and then you feel sorry, first you cry and then you feel sad. That it looks like the card before the horse. I will give you a simple example where William James is perfectly correct. Imagine you are walking down a flight of a staircase. Suddenly you miss a step. You know, then you know that the terrible fear without even finding out the reason. Now there are a few examples like that. But ultimately it became a very important theory and we'll see how it became an important theory. William James was greatly indebted to Darwin. But I shall first present the James Indian theory of emotions. There are chunks and chunks of passages from Jarwin in William James' writing. His description of fear is exactly what Darwin has written. James introduced an interesting writer. Common sense says, Common sense says we lose our fortune, are sorry and weep. We meet a bear and are frightened and run. We are in insulted by a rival, are angry and strike. He defends the notion however, that we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike and so on. This hypothesis looks as if he is putting the cart before the horse. This thesis has been discussed, debated, criticized, over and over again, like the phoenix from the ashes is comes up. You know, the phoenix that comes out of the ashes is like that. This theory. So there's something remarkable in this theory, you see. In fact, this theory emerged in a new form with modern thinkers like Antonio Damasio, the neurologist, Jesse Prince, the philosopher. They, they modified it, but something of James was in this theory. They have modified the new uh, interpretation of James, which makes the Buddhist concept of embodied emotions valuable and workable in practice. That is what I have learned, the idea of embodied emotion, where the body plays an important part. That is what the last thing in uh, James's theory. James defined the body as a mind sounding board allowing the emotional signals to resonate, much as the sound books uh, guitar amplified the sound of the system. This is said by a, a person called Evans, who has it. He says, the body, 
they define the body as the mind's sounding board. Like the emotional signal to resonate, much like the sound box of the guitar amplifies the sound box of the strings. Though the theory sounds narrow, James's lasting contribution was that it is the experience of the bodily symptoms. This is the important thing. If not for the bodily symptoms, there is no anger. If not for the bodily symptoms, there is no fear. If not for the bodily symptoms, there is no joy. So the bodily symptoms, he says if the bodily symptoms are taken out, it becomes just black. If we fancy some strong emotion, then try to abstract from our consciousness all the feelings of its bodily symptoms. We find them nothing left, no mind stuff out of which the emotion can be constructed. What is special in events as I is of Williams is that in meditation, now if you take meditation, very good example. In meditation and relaxation, the calming effects are achieved by the feedback from the body. You see, after, after you meditate, the body tells that it's all calm, it's relaxed. So body speaks in meditation. The rhythmic breathing and relaxed state of the muscles are interpreted by the brain as conducive to the calm frame of mind. So you see how this species, when it is related to meditation, it makes sense. Body speaks in meditation. Also by deliberately suppressing some of the automatic bodily changes, we can have some measure of control. Now you can, you can if you want, by controlling the body. Now if you are going to get angry, kāyāna upasana, mindfulness of the body. By mindfulness of the body, you can reduce your anger. Kāyāna upasana. This, this event's analysis is brilliant. You know, how he turns uh, William James uh, over and over again into a very positive side. We can now measure of control of our emotion, like raising one's fist. And normally when you're angry, you do this. But if you know that, Buddha has said, if you can know that you are going to get angry, that's real mindfulness. Right? So, moment you know that you are going to get angry, you won't release your fist. This is why William Dance is very rich. He brings the importance of the body in emotions. That's why he emphasizes in the body. We leave room for a two-way relation between body and mind. That is really the Buddhist theory. Body has an impact on the mind, mind has an impact on the body. If you read this chapter on the body and mind in this, I have discussed this very well. It's a, it's a two-way relation. There is a feedback mechanism by which the body can affect the mind just as the mind can affect the body. As with any feedback loop, this allows for amplification. James described the body as the mind's sounding board, allowing the emotional signals to resonate. Like the sound board of a guitar, amplifying the sound of the string. James made traffic reference to the activation of the body. He said, everyone knows how panic is influenced by flight. That is, when there is panic, then you, if you, uh, there is flight. And how giving away to grief increases the passions. Sometimes when you start crying, then the sadness increases. So he says, so this is a very interesting thing. Notion that some measure of control of our emotions can be ex exercised by suppressing automatic bodily changes. Now this is very, very Buddhistic satipatthana, kāyāna vipassana. So the body, controlling the body is extreme. That is where the Buddha, Buddha yeah, this is what Risa Kaparoko 
called Somatic Intelligence. Harvard Gardner wrote a book on the types of intelligence, a groundbreaking book. But one place he said the body of the intelligence, intelligence of the body has been neglected. So this book is an answer to Howard Gardner's query, why the intelligence of the body has... Normally we associate the intelligence the body with dancing and things like that, you see. Also, when the body is neglected, now there are people who, you know, from morning till evening, you know, who do something like this, you know, turning wheel, turning wheel. Now they get a special kind of problems, you know, bodily problems, so that body is extremely important, whether you go to health or sickness or whatever. James interrupted to Darwin, is seen in Darwin's description of fear. Now this is beautiful, this is from Darwin. He says, fear means withdrawal of the head backwards, withdrawal of the trunk, projection of the hand, as if to defend against hated object, contraction of the closure of the eyes, elevation of the upper lip, and closure of the nose. These are all elementary movements of turning away. Threatening movements as intense frowning, eyes wide open, display of teeth. Now these come from the animals, you know. The animals show their teeth, you know. Grinding teeth, contracting jaws, open mouth with the tongue advanced, clenched fist, threatening action of arms, to stamping with feet. Now these are all Darwin's description of uh, uh, the body and emotion, which William James has taken bodily and put it into the principle of psychology. So that's why, you know, after hundred years, hundred years, this sounds so familiar. So William James has to be given the credit. Darwin writes on fear, on anger, widely opened eyes and mouth, raised eyebrows, dilated nostrils, stiff posture, motionless, you know, when you're angry, racing heart, increased blood supply if you want to measure your pressure, uh, when you're extremely angry, you know that that's a tremendous movement of the blood supply. Pallor of the skin, cold perspiration, shivering, trembling, and so on and so on. So there are lots of descriptions like this. I gave this example to see how very much this uh, Darwin's description of the body in emotions has been used. So I'm not really going to discuss William James in great detail because as I already shown, he has influenced a great deal of the neuroscientists who came later. And now I go to Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud said something interesting. He says, hysterics behave, that the people suffering from hysteria, as if anatomy does not exist. Interest now, why did he say this? Why did Sigmund Freud? Now, all the others are discussing Darwin, James, everyone is focusing on the body. But this man is saying, people in hysteria behave as if anatomy does not exist. The story is this. Sigmund Freud was a neuroscientist, dissecting frogs and doing all these things, and he was getting disappointed. So he went to France uh, on a scholarship and studied hypnotism. Now, under hypnosis, hypnosis, the famous case of Anna. This Anna could not move the hand, but there was radically nothing wrong with the hand. But through hysteria, she began narrating childhood experience or late experience. All those things which allowed why, why that happened to the hand. Because he was probably trying to touch something prohibitive or something like that. I mean, very, uh, in, in, in short terms. So, he found that 
under hypnosis, the people suffering from hysteria, you, you can change them, you can transform them. And when he came back to uh, Germany or when he came back to work, he used this method of hypnotism. Then what happened was, he found that certain people could not be hypnotized and sometimes it didn't last. He used a therapy called the method of free association. The method of free association, you just start chatting with the patient. And very often he went to dreams, dream analysis. Now he found, for instance, in dream analysis, if, if a person comes into the same picture over and over, over and over again, over and over again, then there is a problem there. So like that, this free association method was very successful. He made great, great headway. Now, Mark Capstein, who had written on Freud, says, Freud had three theories. At that time, people didn't understand. And the third theory is very Buddhistic. Now, this is what Freud, I'll tell you what. Now, Freud later found that the free association method is, there's a paper called Remembering, Freud wrote, where the present is extremely important. So he was opening up the present rather than the past. And, and uh, Mark Gibson said that this third, Freud, third facet of Freud has been neglected. So anyway, I just mentioned this to show that Freud is quite rich. Sigmund Freud started life as a neurosurgeon, but disappointed with the progress, he went to study the brain of frogs. And searching for fresh perspectives, he went to France to work under Chaco and Joseph Breuer. His first book was Joseph Breuer. The work, it's called Studies in Hysteria, written by Freud and Breuer, heralded a new era for Freud. The psychological character of post Suggestion played a key role in tracing repressed ideas in the unconscious. Even now it is used, if not used. John Day says that Freudian revolution stands in marked difference to the James Indian revolution because Freud was looking at the ideas, the ideogenic roots, not, not the body. Though Freud often described emotions as close of energy, his views of them as transmitters of meaning, ideas, was extremely important. Thus, development of the thesis led to the widespread acceptance of the view that studying emotions helped to see feelings, behavior, and bodies as meaningful products of the mind. So, mind became extremely important. They said that this perspective is in marked contrast to James that one can study emotion by studying the neurophysiological process. So that is why it's an alternative thesis looking at the mind, and especially the sub subconscious, how will be in the mind, and it's called the ideogenic theory. The case study of Anna, which Freud did, where the patient could not move her arm, but did not have any physical defect, is a case where through hypnotic treatment, the patient did recover. And it is after Anna's recovery that Freud made the classic statement that hysterics behave as if anatomy does not exist. So that is why he said that. Later, Freud developed a new method of his own, which he described as the method of free association, where unlike hypnotism, the patient was able to get some insight into this problem. Then he presented the unconscious in the normal mind. Freud, uh, extremely interesting, Freud wrote a book called The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. That is the little uh, slips of tongue that you make. Then uh, things that you go to a place and you forget to take your umbrella or you carry someone else's umbrella. <laughs> Those little, little slips of the tongue. Uh, dream interpretation was 
vannak is remarkable studies. In fact, someone asked Freud, if you are going for a holiday, now that you have written some 20 odd volumes, what would you like to go and read? He said, dream interpretation. It's a, it's a fascinating study, though there are a lot of things which people don't agree. Marx Einstein says that in the popular mind, Freud's work is associated with the traumatic unconscious. But Einstein says that Freud's work underwent several stages of change. First is the cathartic view. It's called catharsis. It really comes from the Greek. Catharsis means you have something blocked up. When you talk about it, then there's a release. Second was when he gave up hypnotism with a method of free association. Third stage is the Freud moved from the forgotten past to the immediate person. Einstein says that many interpreters just have Freud, they didn't understand this. Have missed the third stage. There's a beautiful paper called Remembering, Repeating and Working Through, which Einstein, which Einstein says, Einstein says very Buddhistic. The insight of Einstein was so important that I changed the description of the Buddhist concept of answer into the subliminal rather than the unconscious. Yet in Buddhism, and even in more recent psychoanalytic schools, we have a new perspective, one that is less about digging and more about opening. It is very interesting, this Mark Epstein's gives a Tibetan story where a maid is climbing a mountain with a, with full of water. Oh, it's, it's full of water. On the way, she breaks it. And as the water flow, there's some kind of exhilarating state. So he says the important thing is not digging, but opening out. Not digging, but opening out, opening out. So that is really what is at the root of this difference is an alternative view of the unconscious. Now we come to the more difficult aspects of Freud. How do you, I ask, I raise the question, how do you explain UFC? If I imagine that an object beloved by me is united to another person by the same or closer blend of friendship, then that by which I myself alone held the object. I should be affected, hatred towards the object. So in jealousy, fine, you are telling, so you feel very inferior. Then you feel hatred towards the man who is obstructing. And the most interesting, you feel both love and hatred, or Ambivalence towards the path, towards the partner. Freud is the person, first person to use this concept of ambivalence. So in jealousy, you get ambivalence also. Now, you, if you read Shakespeare's, this, this, lots of these famous plays on, uh, I forget the name of that play, uh, where jealousy is depicted, you see. So jealousy is a, is a wonderful uh, emotion to study. You can even write a thesis, thesis on on the nature of jealousy. Jeremy New is another person who has written on jealousy. He refers to the fact that internal complexity of the emotions is so instructive and also that the conceptual surroundings are so rich with a wealth of discrimination such as a difference between envy, resentment, bizarre, malice, spite, ill will, ingratitude, revenge, all this he discusses. Jeremy knew. He has also another article called Jealousy, Attention and Loss. And the ultimate, the most important insight is it is said, the presence and persistence of jealousy have more to do with self-identity, has more to do with self-identity rather than your love or hatred or whatever it is. 
that is the position of others. But the underlying fear may move us into pathological problems. It is important to note it that jealousy may be on many occasions tied to genuine love. So that's why, it's, that's why it's a problem. The same difficulties, for instance, do not come with the inst uh, instance. Now, envy, envy, envy is not that complex, right? Jealousy is an emotion that has perceived danger to the self at the center, generating various of defense, depression, withdrawal, anger. Now, you, you do various things kinds of things when jealousy is, is uh, worrying you. In summary then, we discuss jealousy according to Freud's one's position as a favorite individual is threatened. Right? Jealousy may be understood in terms of possessive behavior. Jealousy may be understood as a crisis in personal identity. Self love is extremely important. Now, these are all extremely interesting in the background of emotions analysis in Buddhism, which I have done in my, in my work, you know. Thus, with a sense of ego injury. You know, this is called mana anuse, so the tremendous feeling of uh, conceit. Primary narcissism, and this uh, paper on narcissism, self love, also captures all this. What is special about jealousy is the fear of the loss character is what is special to people. But the immediate focus of envy is different. I have discussed when you have now. now. Uh, now, one of the most interesting things that emerged out of this is Freud's paper on narcissism or self-love. Uh, narcissism or, or self-love. I, I want to get on that really the last uh, point that I will take up about self-love and narcissism. It is of great interest that Freud gradually came to recognize that ego is the actual seat of anxiety. His last, the later writings of an anxiety, and anxiety, ego is the actual seat. So it is really anatta, a study of anatta. As a result, his work on narcissism acquired a new meaning, and the probing of the emotions of anxiety and jealousy gave him a new dimension of applied value. Freud's beautiful paper on narcissism is one of the rich possessions I have had since I made a comparative study of Buddhism and Freud. You must, uh, you know, get a copy of it and read it. Narcissism, about 10, 15 pages. You see. But as I discussed earlier, Freud was baffled by the, the third, the next point is a very difficult question. He introduced a concept called the death instinct. In Greek they use the word Thanatos and I have compared this to Vibhavatana. Is there anyone here who likes to discuss what Vibhavatana is? It's a, it's a very difficult concept. Now, Kamatana is the craving for sensual purpose. Bhavatana is the craving for ego identity. Vibhavatana According to my analysis, is the craving for self-destruction. Now take a man, alcoholic. He knows that the next next drink is going to finish him up, but yet he takes it. So there is this. Uh, I have done study of alcoholism and related to Vibhavatana, so that there are people like that to do that. So sometimes. When there is no other alternative to do that, so Vibhavatana. Now, Freud described this as what is called 
repetition compulsion. Repetition compulsion. Now, what is repetition compulsion? He saw his grandson playing a game. It's a piece of wood tied to a rope, setting it under the bed, taking it, in, take, taking it out, and yeah, what are you doing? His mother had gone shopping <laughs> and left him. So he was trying to master that unpleasant experience. So Freud, you have the idea of and, uh, Freud's book on the death instincts. For ages, people had not really uh, seen its meaning. Now, I, in my thesis, which is now has been published in, in uh, 2010, in Melbourne, you can get a copy of it. I will send a copy of it to a department here, so that Buddhist and Persian psychology, where uh, uh, Vibhava and Vinasa, the two Pali words, are synonymous synonymously used in the Majjhima Nikaya. Now that was the point around that I worked and I described Vibhavatana, the craving for satisfaction. Normally it goes out, but here it goes in. According to Jacobson, when we probe identity problems in Buddhist perspective, the deeper we see the indeterminacy. Inside it is lack of determinism, ambiguity, formlessness within ourselves when you go and analyze it. This basic indeterminism of the human creature, the ambiguity and the formless, is at the center of many lives today. There's the lives that are broken, people who are in boredom, who are in nullity and so on. So he says that Buddha's brilliant, unique grasp of the Anatta doctrine helps us to understand some of these things. So you can and apart from narcissism, uh, if you want to understand uh, the, the death instincts, the death instinct is really more ambivalent. You love yourself, you hate yourself. You hate yourself, you love yourself. So it comes like that, you see. Freud, I'll just finish up, but this I have already discussed in earlier class. You know, we were discussing depression and Freud's insight on the loss of sadness, the wonderful, wonderful insight. Gradually, I shall discuss Freud's lecture on depression and grief. I have already referred to this. Freud showed real profundity when he said that the aim of psychoanalysis was to replace Neurotic unhappiness by normal unhappiness. A psychiatry based on a hedonistic calculus, a psychiatry does not recognize that periods of anxiety and melancholy are a necessary part of human life. Exactly that is Dukkha. A psychiatry based on a purely hedonistic calculus, a psychiatry that does not recognize that periods of Anxiety and melancholy are a necessary part of human life, such as such a psychiatry will no more than a superior life. The Buddha was also attempting to replace neurotic unhappiness by normal unhappiness. And echoes Freud, for instance, and Freud said he was merely transforming hysterical misery into unhappiness. So that's the Freudian contribution. So when you put them together, James, Darwin, Freud, you know, it's a very really rich harvest that I have showed you within this short time. And the copies of this paper are there. So study it well, it's very interesting. It's only very recently that there's a revival of interest in Freud because of his sex theories, his libido theories. And he wrote a book called Beyond the Pleasure Principle, in which he discussed this, the, the Thanatos of Vibhava Tanna, which up to date, some people are yet baffled. I would have read it about 10 times, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, about 150 pages, you know. Now that one, the paper on narcissism, 
So I think as someone in how I said at the interview, I have rediscovered Freud. I had my PhD interview and they said, along with your Buddhist insights, you have rediscovered. So I will send you a copy of the book. It was published 30, 40, 30, 40 years back, I will finish my PhD. But now 2000 in Melbourne, they have a new edition of Buddhism. So, like William James and Darwin, I think Sigmund Freud, uh, I am a little biased because I have been studying this, but I think, uh, yes, I think that is really Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for Professor's inspiring lecture. Uh, now the the session is open to the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please write on the paper given. So um, I have a few questions here. The first one, can you tell us more about where universal emotions have been found to not be universal? For example, exceptions to the rule. Do these exceptions tell us anything important about evolution or the limits of evolutionary psychology? Can you tell us more about where universal universes have been found to, not to be universal? Exceptions to the rule. Do this exception tell us what about evolution? There is, this is a good question. Because these Darwin's and Edmund's theories have come under criticism. So the people have tried to... Uh, uh, now one of the problems is that when they took these photographs into different cultures, the response was not very similar. So, which means perhaps that particular, particular culture, they are not basic. Other thing is, these basic emotions also have come under criticism. So, there are, there are limitations. There are limitations in this theory of basic emotions. But generally, you know, sadness, fear, anger, surprise is really not a, even an emotion, you know. So these are fairly universal. They're universal, but they, their dominance from culture to culture is different. And there are some cultures where the results are not very clear, but I think even today, uh, there have been a number of books. Others have criticized basic emotions theory from a Freudian angle. Now, that is the cognitive theories. Now, cognitive theories Robert Solom Bob Solomon was the pioneer cognitive theory. In fact, he, he died at the age of 65 uh, uh, when they were going to take the plane. His wife, uh, Higgins, Captain Higgins, uh, edited the memorial volume to him, and I have written, uh, written an article to that. Now, he, like others, the cognitive theory say, the meaning of an emotion is found in thought patterns. So you can't overdo. But later, uh, Bob Sutherland also agreed that you can't ne uh, neglect the body. So there's a battle. This question is important. Sorry, I could not really get into this area. Because there's a battle among the various theories of emotion. So the cognitive theories are very strong. Now the somatic on what I have written, they have really come up. They have come up, especially with the neuroscience, development of neuroscience and so on. Now the other theories of emotions are some focus on motivation. The, the importance of an emotional life in human motivation. This anger as a motive, uh, jealousy as a motive and so on. So you get the somatic, somatic theories, then you get the cognitive theories, 
then they get uh, so the Freudian ideas are very useful for cognitive theories. So like that there are, I mean, no, number of emotion theories. So there's no time to go into all this in detail because I was trying to, uh, after writing this book, I've been sort of greatly interested in the body and emotions and so Freud is, we have done work on that. But there are many other theories of emotions which uh, uh, one can go into. Yes. It's a good question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can jealousy and love exist together for one person to another person? Like a father jealous of his son existing for taking part of his love from his wife? Can those conflicts be divided or it always be part of our mind? Can jealousy and love exist together for one person to another? Like a father jealous of his son existing for the, to love, uh, love his wife, can the, can the control be divided or it always be part of the mind? Yeah, this first question is a very interesting question. Can jealousy and love coexist together? That's the problem, you see. Only thing is, there is a verbal problem here. Right? Now, when you say love, real love, does it implicate in jealousy? If you love and if you have jealousy, then it's not real love. I mean, these are playing with words, but uh, so we got the lots of, so really, real love doesn't indicate jealousy. But we live in a real world. When we really were, when you have a, if a person loves another one and feel very, very intimate, then there is a feeling of jealousy someone stands into me. In the, in the family circle, these things come in a very complicated way. It's a very, very nice question. Like a father jealous of his son existing to take part of his love for his wife. Yes, this is the same thing, you see. Now, if you go into Sigalavada Sutra, you get a kind of answer for this. Have you heard of the Sigalavada Sutra? Sigalavada Sutra is an ethic for the layman. The relationship between husband and wife between friends and friends, uh, between wife, wife and husband. Like that, various types of rela relations uh, beautifully because you have to respect the parents. But the parents also have to have... So like that, if you take the Sigalavada Sutra, someone can write a nice thesis or something like that using the Sigalavada Sutra and then raising these problems about love and jealousy. They are human, the, on a human side it's there, but there's a way of defining love so that it keeps jealousy out. Uh, you can define it like Can the control be divided or it's always part? No, it's something like this. A father's Love for the son is different from a father's love for his wife. You see this? That is why I said, go to the Sigala Vada Sutra. That is different. A father's love for the son is different. Father's love for the wife is different. Wife's love for the son is different. We use the same word. So love is a big word. Love is a big word. It has so many. If you take the Pali words, it can be into Pema. Pema is not really, really good love. It's love. But uh, now take uh, Metta. That's a very powerful form of love. So you see, there's a lot of verbal jagdari here, but Sigadavada Sutra is the best, best model, best model 
on me. It's a, it's a nice uh, uh, question that you ask. Thank you, and this is again, uh, you are going to have a uh, department of counseling, developing, and all. Here is a nice subject for a thesis, you see. Taking the Sigbevas and taking all the uh, human emotion, how they. Now, Sigalavada uh, Sutra also has between a worker and his superior. You know, the, their relationship, which is also between a teacher and a student. Between a teacher and a student. Now, sometimes teachers fall in love with the student, you know, and then you get problems, you know. So, but anyway, teachers and students. So the Sigalavada Sutra is a good kind of model to differentiate. You don't use the same word to describe two or three relationships. Thank you. A very good question. Today the questions are very good. Thank you. In Buddhism, there is a saying, the mind is the forerunner of everything. But William James said, first you cry and then you feel sad. First you run, and then you feel fear. So what do you think the relationship of the mind, emotions, and our physical reactions? In Buddhism, there is a saying, mind is the forerunner of everything. But William James said, first you cry, and then you feel sad. First you run and then you feel fear. So what do you think the relationship of the mind, emotions and our physical relations? This is exactly what we have been discussing now. Now, if the mind is so powerful, but you know the term mind here again creates problems, you know. That is where the that is where, where the motivation is carried gain ground, chetana. And so really, uh, there are various components, that's chetana. Then the mind can uh, also, in my first lesson to be followed, you don't get pure mind. Very often what you get is embodied mind. So mind and body, they are so linked. Body acts on the mind and mind acts on the body. That is the Buddhist theory, as I mentioned. That is uh, basically the, if you read this, the body-mind problem. But it is a nice question. So really, the answer to that is, the deeper answer is that the body acts on the mind and the mind acts on the body. And in a more restricted sense, you can also speak about the mind as embodied. Mind as embodied, and the link is very strong. Well, today the questions are very good, very nice questions. They all, I think they'll be the, been listening to me for a while now. It's <laughs> third day, we got your minds are working very well, very well. Very good question. Earlier, some of these stuff was have been new to you, but I think now you are. You are doing well. Anything else? Okay, the next question is, Buddhist teachings emphasize faith. However, it seems Buddhist counseling doesn't involve faith. Is it necessary to add the content of faith into Buddhist counseling? Buddhist teachings emphasize faith. However, it seems, Buddhist counseling doesn't involve faith. Is it necessary to add the content of faith into Buddhist counseling? This is a very difficult question. <laughs> Out of all the questions that are. Because this word faith, because the word faith, Buddhist counseling doesn't involve It seems Buddhist counseling does not, uh, I, the problem is, there is no one brand of counselling. There are so many brands of counselling. Now, if you take mindfulness-based uh, uh, 
cognitive theory, mindfulness cognitive theory, developed by John Kabat Singh and all those people. Now they don't, in fact, formally uh, use Buddhism, right? But I, I but he, he says towards the end, uh, something like that, you get a feeling that Buddhism has inspired him. When I met John Kabat Singh at uh, Monash, I presented the psychology book to him and we came to know each other and he was really, uh, he was very glad that I had consulted Vedava Jnanaponik and he was reading the Sajvartana, you know. So they are acquainted with all these Buddhists, uh, they know and they have, they don't deny that they have taken these ideas, you know, that, that they are only thinking the point of commitment is rather loose. Point of commitment is rather loose. Now for me, it's different. For me, because I'm not just a, just a Buddhist, but my life has been that. So I, uh, whatever I do, I have a tremendous, you might call it faith or whatever it is, tremendous conviction. It is not a faith. For me, it's a conviction that the Buddha has presented all these things and they can work. But there are a lot of other things I do independent of Buddhism. Independent of Buddhism. I mean, so I think generally uh, it depends from counseling to counseling. You can't, you can't uh, generalize and say uh, that this counsel is there in Buddhism. So, uh, the best example is uh, mindfulness-based uh, mindfulness uh, therapy, that uh, cognitive therapy. So there are lots of other than there is uh, avoidance therapy. Now, in fact, they, they leave out Buddhism completely, but you find that they are uh, using those ideas. There has been a big controversy around this. What is Buddhistic, what is not Buddhistic. So I think what I can do is not to comment on others, but you know, do my own thing and also see the best in the mindfulness of cognitive therapy. Now, I have my lecture on pain management. I am using, using the ideas. I am referring to them. So it's something like that. So you must make it a, some all or nothing affair. Uh, there are some therapies which don't use infinite therapies. Others use Buddhist ideas but they don't make a big, big deal out of it. So I think it, it, it varies uh, from therapy to therapy and I can only speak for myself. I can only speak for myself. And I have also found certain forms of therapy which are not directly Buddhist, but you know, uh, they can be useful and so on. So because this word faith, you know, it's a, uh, what I have is, it's not just blind faith. You take a religion, you study, you take it up and down and in your life up and down. And in your therapy, you try your best to integrate it and so on and so on. Now a Buddhist can without getting entangled in Buddhism at all. Do, uh, do some therapy which can be very Buddhistic. That's the problem, you know. So, from our angle, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is very Buddhistic. It's, it's, it's very Buddhistic, but we have to be careful about these labels and so on. So, that's a difficult question, but I think each person has to Say so what he feels like. Well, there are a lot of uh, uh, various therapies which are enough, for instance. I'll give a very good example dialectical behavior therapy. You know, dialectical behavior therapy would not have made that headway if not for Zen Buddhism. I had a 
discuss that here. Chapter on dialectical behavior therapy. The idea is that uh, you get this in the Tibetan tradition also, probably in some of the Chinese tradition, that anger and compassion can live side by side. The last Vesak in Sri Lanka, I presented a paper on crime and punishment. And I took Dostoevsky's book, novel Crime and Punishment. The hero, the eyes, I forget how you pronounce it. Ros Roskokovo, something like that. Now this chap kills a money lender because he doesn't like that profession. But later he develops terribly. He becomes very compassionate. He falls in love with a lady who moves this, this plan and that plan. And then he begins to develop some tremendous love to this lady. And then, you know, that dialectic, that, 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 that dialectic can be harnessed. So this is what Marshall, Marshall Lyon, I forget the name of this lady, the uh, dialectic behavior therapist. She found this. There is a very famous book, which uh, a novel, which came uh, just just give me just so that I can. It's here. It's a wonderful novel. It's really after that I wrote that chapter. Ah, this is the book. Van Gilder Kira, The Buddha and the Borderland, published by Nizahat. Now, Van Gilder Kira is a remarkable life. Remarkable life of a person. Like the, the crime and punishment. She has a whole side of very bad, very bad, very bad. And then suddenly, it was goodness, goodness, goodness. You can think of Angulimala if you want to. So you see that uh, dialectical behavior therapy is very much interested than Buddhism. But that also she doesn't always advertise. Now this lady who had written this novel uh, I, I think ultimately she ent uh, lived in a monastery. Monastery which had probably a uh, ritual, you know, traditional ritual and so on. So uh, there are these, uh, you know, Christianity. There are some people who use Christianity as a kind of background to uh, counseling and so on. So uh, Buddhism provides a background, but you can't generalize. You can't generalize. Uh, you have sort of, if each person, for me, uh, I know to what extent Buddhism is reflected on my therapy. I know some a simple thing like I did lot of, lot of anger that day. We had a lot of discussion on anger. Straight from Satipatta, right? So I am deliberately using the text, using this practicing my meditation, spent eight years of uh, practicing meditation, and this is dedicated to my guru. So, my interest in Buddhism is immersed. It's transparent. But mindfulness-based cognitive self is different, and there are different interpretations. But I find for pain management, they're very good. My hero has been Risa Kaparo and uh, Vidyamali Birch. Vidyamali Birch was trained by, uh, uh, was trained by uh, this, uh, these people, but uh, Risa Kaparo is a very different kind of individual who was more mystic. Uh, it's a kind of blend, you know. Vidyamali Birch quotes from the sutras also. She's, she looks more like a traditional Buddhist, but so uh, cognitive therapy has 
been the subject of a lot of critical studies, analysis and so on. But we have to give them the quality. In my case, I like to observe whatever good is found in things and I don't say that they don't refer to the Buddha or whatever it is and so on. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the most difficult questions I have got to. <laughs> okay, the next one. In Chinese Buddhist counseling, we usually contact senior master for help. Senior monks usually have ability to read clients' mind. They usually talk out answers and fix mental problems before clients ask questions. I have met three of this kind of masters. What is this kind of counseling in Buddhist studies? How to have those reading abilities? Does your study related to this kind of phenomena? In Chinese Buddhist counseling, we usually contact senior master for help. Senior monk usually have ability to read clients' mind. They will talk. They usually talk out answers and fix mental problems before client ask questions. I have met three of these kind of master. What is this kind of counseling in Buddhist studies? How to have those ready abilities? That's your study related to this. Unfortunately, I, this is a tradition. I don't have much. I mean, after I came here, I got interested. After I came here, I got interested. And maybe in the future, so I can't pass comments, you know, on this conference, but I try to see what is there. It's something like this, you know. You get this here, very seasoned counselor who have done this for what are ages and is very sharp and so on. And maybe if you have a meditative mind and that sort of thing, you may be having extraordinary powers, not of telepathy, but extraordinary powers of understanding the problem and helping the problem. Now, really good counsel, counseling is that. Counseling means understand your problem, but it's not mind reading, but really grasping what is really the problem. Senior monk are able to read clients' mind. It's not reading the mind. That sounds like telepathy. Just to understand the predicament. What is the, why is he stuck so angry? That's, uh, you know, then you, you have a better insight, and that might be transcendental or not, I don't know, but it's a sharp, very developed insight. Insight. They use it to work out answers and fix mental problems before client ask question. That's a little difficult. That's a little difficult. Uh, but broadly, broadly, a, a good counselor, if someone comes with a story or someone. It doesn't go very far. He can grasp, you know, what the problem is, what the situation is. And of course, I have to learn myself about Chinese Buddhist counseling because I have a lot of respect for it and a lot of. Uh, so I think uh, I also may probably come to know more about it. But there can be people, people who are sorry, you know, the Buddha himself, you know, like the Buddha, when a person comes, you know. Uh, he can, he can very often. So if the Buddha has those powers, then maybe spiritual, you know, spiritual masters who have that special power when a person comes. Sometimes the way that a person comes and so on. So mind reading is possible. Mind reading, I cannot say anything very much, but it's like something like reading a person's mind. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see if there are instances in the Buddhist discourses where the Buddha, you know, does something similar, you know, a person comes. Anyway, yeah, so uh, it's something that I like to learn about more, but uh, there is no theoretical problem 
there are some money so advanced that the person can't uh, can understand the problem and see the answer and see uh, what can be. Even if some of the very good counselors also have something close to that. Yeah. Okay, the next question. Can we be jealous for something that we never had? For example, we have never been at the favorite position and still be jealous of the person who has got it? Can we be jealous for something that we never had? For example, we have never been at the favorite position and still be jealous of the person who has got it. Yes, this is, this is, there's no problem. Uh, <laughs> there's no problem at all. We are there. There is something we don't have, but the other person has. There's really no problem at all. There's something like this. There is what is called admirable envy. Now, admirable envy is I have a, I have put up a new house and all parents and so on. Someone comes to, friend comes to see me. So my friend says, of course, it will, it will take ages for me, it will take quite a lot of time for me to put up a house like that, but I envy you. Now that envy is admirable then. He likes to imitate. That is there. But this one, I don't think there's any problem about being jealous of something that very, very often we are jealous of things that we don't have. If we are jealous of things we can ne never get, then that's a little different. <laughs> then we are more angry rather than <laughs> this. Right? If you are jealous of things that you can't obtain, you are more angry than this. Right? Okay. Okay, the last one here. Can you explain more about Venus in Buddhist theory? Dear Professor, can you explain more about fear? Yeah, I think he means fear. Uh, F-E-A-R. F -E I think he means fear. No, it says fear and death, yes. Yeah. That's about that, fear. That, I think he means fear. F, ah, it should be F-E-A-R. Correct me fear. if I'm wrong, huh? Ah, fear. Fear, there's no problem about fear. Now, fear is generally... There are basic fears. For instance, your attachment to your body, your attachment to your life. So when you have strong attachments, the Buddha has explained it very well, when you have strong attachments, uh, that you have fear. Now, if there is a very rich millionaire in Australia, something like that, you know, person need not be worried here, because that has nothing to do with him. Right? So really, fear is there only when you have attachment, when you have possessions. Then fear is very natural. And certain fears are also necessary. And that is the fear of leading a bad life. Now, Buddha advocates this. Good fears are there. Fear of losing a bad, uh, leading a bad life, uh, fear of having done the wrong thing, but not to, not to exaggerate and not to fall the victim. Then there are other forms of fear like dread and so on. Certain fears, uh, certain fears, you, you can't find the object. Why is... So you get this in counseling. You get people with fears that sometimes are very difficult to put out what's wrong with him. That is, it has gone into the unconscious. Unconscious and so that's, that's a no, not a normal fear. That's a, we call it a phobia. A phobia is not a normal fear. That is, a, a, there are people who have all kinds of... And there are people who are, have phobias of height. 
phobias of empty space. Now there are people who, are, who go for counseling, so this is sort of phobias. Then fear of, the fear of dread is very important. Fear of dread, fear of doing the wrong thing. Not an unnatural fear, but the sort of, so, fear, anyway, as, uh, of course, Darwin said, fear is a very natural thing. It sort of, when it does challenge yourself and so on, there is fear. But if you are on the path to perfection, then you know, you, you don't, you ultimately don't have fears. You see. Some people have fears about next life and so on and so on. Okay. Thank you very much for Professor's very inspiring lecture this evening and um, we are really thankful to Professor for his compassion uh, for traveling all the way from Australia to Hong Kong to give uh, the series of lectures this time. So please join me to give another big round of applause to Professor Da Silva. In addition to the lectures... Very, very, very good questions. Almost all, very compared to the yesterday's one, I think there's some kind of maturity on emotions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for all your good questions. So in addition to the lecture series this time, the Mama Charitable Foundation has also very generously sponsored one more event, which is a two-day symposium in Buddhist counseling on coming Saturday and Sunday. Professor Da Silva will serve as the keynote speaker of the symposium and give a talk with the theme, Mindfulness-Based Pain Management and Cognitive Behavior Therapy in the section on Saturday morning. And there are many more speakers from local and abroad who will present on various topics in the field of Buddhist counseling. So please do miss it and register for the event if you haven't done so. So we hope to see you again in the symposium in the coming weekend and have a nice evening. Thank you.